Good evening and welcome to The Journey Home. I'm Marcus Grodi, your host for this program. I wanted to begin uh, this program tonight. Uh, recently had a, a great privilege of speaking at a Catholic men's conference and then a Catholic women's conference. And it was what a joy and a pleasure as I was at those conferences to encounter so many Journey Home fans, so many of you that had an opportunity to thank me and thank EWTN for this program. And just to let you know that EWTN and I always appreciate when we hear from you, emails or uh, tweets or maybe Facebook comments about what our programming means to you and the journey home. It's hard to know, you know my guest and I are on this side of the camera and, when we're, and I'm gonna help Greg tell his story. We don't see you out there, although maybe new technology someday I'll be able to see in your living rooms. But it's good to hear that these programs, all the programs of EWTN are encouragement to you. So thank you for your kind comments and your prayers. We appreciate that and your support, of course, for the network. My guest tonight is Greg Pratt, former agnostic. It's a great pleasure to invite Greg to the program. Welcome, Greg. Thank good you to have you here, me. hear your whole story. I'm, I'm glad. I'm glad you. I, when you were saying that I that you, that you got the feedback and it feels good, I'm glad you do because you do wonderful things here, and I'm I'm so uh, happy well, you've, you've you've got me here. Well, I, I'll, I'll find out in a moment, but it sounds like you're one of those guests that this is the last place you ever thought you'd be for most of your life, <laughs> and not just a Catholic, but Christian at all. Absolutely, absolutely. All right. It was a long time coming. Uh, <laughs> I. I I came from a, a house that didn't have any faith. There, 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 by definition, we were Jewish, but it was in, it was in name only. Um, there were a couple of celebrations here and there. I was bar mitzvahed, but there was no religious significance to it. There was no talk of God. There was no talk of you know anything supernatural. Um, it still blows so many of us away when we think about that secularism that's, that's a part of Judaism. Because there are nominal Catholics and nominal Christians, but they kind of know. Right. But you're saying there's no, there's no even no, this sense. No, this, this, was, this, was, this is what was expected. Yeah. And um, as far as I know, in my extended family, uh, there really nobody did. I, I, I could be wrong. There might, uh, there, I'll get a call from a cousin that says, no, I've always, <laughs> I'll, and I'll, I'll be put to shame. But um, it was just that, that's what it, that's, that's what it was. And uh, so I grew, up, I grew up without faith. Um, and I've got, this, I've got this science and math mindset, physics and tearing stuff apart and if possible, putting it back together if you find all the pieces. And, and I just love doing that kind of stuff. So my, my whole mindset was natural world, finding the answers in science and math and those absolute kinds of answers. And, and um, so that was, that was well, my worldview. Um, grew up without faith, but I always had a pull. I've had a pull. My, my earliest childhood memory is staying up late and watching the moon landing with my mom when I was five years old. My next earliest childhood memory is uh, sitting in a church. Uh, I, I, I slept over at a friend's house or something, and when the family went to church on Sunday, they took me to because they weren't going to leave me at home. And I remember just sitting in church and just sort of looking around and saying, I wish I had what these people had, you know? And I was just a kid at the time, so I'm not, I, I certainly wasn't talking in the way I would talk now. Oh, this is really, really neat. But they just seemed to have a joy and a peace about them that, that, that was attractive. I mean, it was certainly attractive. So from the earliest times, I had this pull towards faith. Um, it was just sort of constant and unrelenting throughout my entire life. And it took me a long time to come to faith. You may have had a pull, but not being able to put categories or words or file folders into what this pull is all about. Oh. It, it just, but it was there. Absolutely. In your science and math, which was a big part of my life too at that age, in high school. Had you taken the next step to the metaphysics? Was your math and science give you an answer to the world and where it came from and where it was going? Uh, well, I, I, science and math would tell me a lot of how things worked. I want to know why things worked. Yeah. But I'm, I'm saying that now at 51 years of age. Back then, no. I still remember in college really not liking the philosophy course. It's only been since then I've really gotten into <laughs> philosophical and metaphysics and that kind of stuff. Um, but I, I, like you say, I had really nowhere to organize my, my, my thoughts and my pulls. I, people that grow up in faith and perhaps wander, uh, they know where to go back to. <laughs> 
and, and I didn't have a go back to, to go back to. So I just sort of searched on my own. And I have a deep reverence for faith. I, I didn't have it. I wanted it. Couldn't get there. But I have a deep reverence for faith, which sort of kept me from talking about it <laughs> with anybody because I didn't want to steal their faith. I had doubts. I had concerns. I said, you know, the natural world explains this, explains this. And I didn't want to steal anything, so I didn't really talk to anybody. I just tried to figure it out on my own. I thought, science and math mindset, if I can understand it, then I can believe it. It doesn't work. Augustine says it's just the opposite, but that's, that's <laughs> another thing. But so I revered it, and I couldn't come to faith because I couldn't cheapen it by pretending to believe when I knew I didn't. That, that was not going to feel good. And uh, if you had asked me back then, what was I hoping to get out of faith? Um, I probably wouldn't have had a co coherent answer, but I know that it wasn't to have a relationship with God, to get to heaven, uh, protect me from this illness. It wasn't any of those kinds of things. It was a search for a deeper absolute truth. You know, again, going back to the science and mindset, the, the science and math and physics mindset. So a deeper sense of certainty about things, exactly about life and, and all of that. Exactly. You know, not only how it all works, but why. Yeah. And and you know, somebody pull back the veil and show me why this works <laughs> so so magnificently well. It's a wonderfully in, intelligible universe, but why is it put together this way? And probably in addition to that, I wanted to know that there was some sort of a, a ground or or basis for morality that it wasn't just the whim of this culture or that culture or some trendsetter, that there was, there was actually, and I believe that. I, I've always believed in, in there's an absolute set of morals, but I wanted to know that there was, a, there was, a, there was a, a ground behind that. So at 18, I'm in college. I meet the love of my life, who eventually becomes my wife, uh, Lucy, and she's just a doll. And, and she's a cradle Catholic. She's, she was Catholic all her life. And uh, I found that out during that, during that uh, intense explorative phase where you go back and forth with your beloved and you find out everything about them. And so she knew wh what my background was and I knew what her background was. And, uh, but we didn't talk about religion uh, at all because, well, we were dating, so we were smooching a lot. And, but we weren't, <laughs> we weren't really talking religion. Um, and, and I think the same, the same fear I would have would, would come up that I didn't want to express my doubts to her. She's this just lovely, joyous, joyful person that just, you know, her smile just lights up a room. I know that's a cliche, but when she goes and does errands around town, she just got to brighten so many people's day just by, just by being her. Um, she's definitely- were you, afraid of, were you afraid of hurting her face? When you yeah. Meant, that's what you were- Absolutely. When you meant stealing it, stealing yeah, and, away from her. That, yeah. That, that, under, yeah. I wouldn't want to insert doubt into that because I had doubt and I consider myself a relatively bright guy. So if I had doubt then maybe these were really real good thoughts and I didn't want to share them with anybody because I didn't, if you've got faith, I, I love it. It's great. It's wonderful. You know, some people abuse it. Some people don't use it correctly. Some people use it as a crutch, what have you. But the vast majority of people I saw that did have faith, it was just this, this, peace, joy, calm, all of this other kind of stuff. And I, I didn't want to be the agent of, of pulling that away. So um, we got married. I remember a couple of years after we got married, I turned to her one time, still an agnostic, and I turned to her one time and I said, um, you know, Luz, you're the best evidence that I've got that God exists. And of course, it was a mushy moment, and I got a kiss out of it. But it was it was genuine because it was just this this unconditional love that comes out that I hadn't yet learned, and she was an example of to me, and 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 right there all the time, and it was just phenomenal. So, for the sake of time, I'm going to skip past most of the next twenty years. Oh, but just because <laughs> well, well, because to get to get to the meat of of what happened. But the, the next 20 years really was just sort of ups and downs in, uh, is the pull really strong now or, or just sort of weak and I'm just going on with my life? And it sort of ebbed and flowed. Was she practicing her faith? No, no, okay. she, she wasn't practicing her faith very often. She was, um, I don't want to say a lapsed Catholic. She's always had faith, this beautiful blind faith, right. uh, but she wasn't practicing. Okay. You know, I, I'm, I'm sure if I was practicing, we would have gone together. Now that I'm practicing, we are going together. Um, but she wasn't. 
Um, so I, I kept searching, and you know, and 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 again, Lucy knew I was I was searching, but she was respectful. She didn't push anything or say come with me or anything else like that. And uh, at this point, I'm starting to get in, like you were saying, the, the, the metaphysical, the philosophical. So, you know, at, at times when the pull was strong, I'd start wrestling with things like, uh, gee, free will versus God's foreknowledge. How do you reconcile that, you know, and, and work that out and figure out how God's eternal nature, okay, okay, I can see how that worked, and, and wrestle through these things based upon what I knew God was like. And, uh, you know, things like that, problem of pain, problem of evil, th those things I, I wrestled through. But that was sort of, you know, 20 years, it just sort of floundered along. In early 2011, five years, almost, almost exactly five years ago, I find myself in possession of Mere Christianity by C.S. Lewis. Oh my gosh. Who slipped that to you? I got it. Uh, I actually, there, there, there was, it was an odd thing. I ended up reading a chapter of another of his books because uh, we, we had, a, we had a, 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 unfortunately, a dog that, that we were trying to deal with putting down. And, and there was a chapter on animal pain in his book, The Problem of Pain. Mm -hmm. And my, my wife had borrowed that book from the neighbor. And I read that chapter as a guide to me uh, in dealing with this. And I fell in love with the writer, C.S. Lewis. <laughs> So I said, I want to read everything this guy's ever read or written. And I went to the internet and, and looked up, you know, which order should I read it in? And everybody says, Mere Christianity first. Either that or the, or the Chronicles of Narnia, one of the two. But Mere Christianity is what I picked. And uh, here I am, I'm searching for faith. Mere Christianity, great. And the book was perfect for me. Uh, I'm quite certain you're very familiar with the book. Yeah. The first third of it is perfect for an agnostic. It doesn't talk about faith at all. Yeah. You know, it's just talking about human interactions. It's talking about morality. Have you ever noticed that this happens and this happens? And, and he's, you know, he's leading you along, but every once in a while he says, now, hey, don't get ahead of me. I'm not talking about faith. I'm nowhere near God yet. Just back off, you know? And I'm just, I'm reading and I'm loving the way he's, loving the way he talks. I'm just falling in love with this book. I'm falling in love with this author. And I get to the point where he starts introducing the character of Jesus Christ. And he gives a couple of snippets from the Gospels, stuff that I knew just even as an agnostic, you sort of know in the air and culture about uh, um, uh, offering to forgive sins, sins that you weren't a part of. Uh, gee, that's sort of reserved for God, isn't it? Uh, yeah, but somehow, for some reason, when we read that, we don't get offended by that. It's, isn't that odd? That, you know, he brings that up. And, and uh, w when he says this or when he does this, it, don't you realize, you know, it, even his opponents today will read the Bible and say, yes, he's humble and meek. But if you actually read his words, he's sometimes anything but humble and meek. But so isn't it interesting that we, we see that and we, and we have these feelings? Uh, so that makes sense. And then he just drops the hammer and he says, in the last, last paragraph of that chapter, he says, what I'm trying to avoid here is the very silly thing that people say about Jesus, which is that, well, I can accept him as a great moral teacher, but he's human. And C.S. Lewis, which has been perfectly logical up until this point, continues and says, that's the one thing we cannot say about him, is that he's a great moral teacher and only human. Think about it. If any mere human went around saying and doing the things that Jesus did, he and he, wasn't, and he wasn't God, he would not be a great moral teacher. He would either be a liar or he'd be a lunatic, you know, the liar, lunatic, or Lord. You know, he'd either be crazy or a charlatan or whatever. And I remember reading that, I was sitting up in bed and it was like a two by four came out from the side and just sort of hit me in the center of the head because this was precisely my worldview. He had just quoted my precise, if, if anybody had asked me, what do you think of Jesus Christ? I'd say, he's a great moral teacher. I love his morality. I love, I, you know, I, I like the moral teachings, but that's as far as it goes. I had gotten to the point in my life where I believed he actually was a human who walked the face of the planet, but divine, no, no, no. Yeah. So and here's a good guy. Yeah, good guy, good guy. great, you know, that. Our, our, I was just going to mention, our guest is Greg Pratt, uh, for those just listening to the program. Recently, somebody pointed out, yeah, if he was such a good guy, then why did everybody want to kick, throw him off a cliff? We recently had that gospel. Why you don't you don't want to push good people off a cliff? Exactly. exactly. They didn't think he was a good guy. Well, they they <laughs> thought he was merely human. So if he's merely human, he's either a lunatic or he's a charlatan of the first order. So push him off a cliff. <laughs> so 
there was there was a certain logic to that. It was a tremendous logic to that. And it hit, like I said, it hit me like a two by four in, in the forehead. And I remember sitting there thinking, oh my gosh, that that changes everything. And my sort of passive search for faith all of a sudden just skyrocketed because he had taken out from taken out from under me this this stand that I was standing on saying this is what I believe about Jesus. And it was just you it's the only it, it's the only thing that you can say about Jesus that doesn't make any logical sense. No, excuse me. Something to that effect. It, you, you just can't logically say that. And I and I recognized that and I said, okay, I've got some deciding to do. So Lucy, you had asked if she was practicing her faith, just, just about the same time, or just a, a few months earlier, she had started practicing her faith again, going back to Mass and going, going that, and she had just started a Bible study over at our parish. And so I get hit in the head by, by C.S. Lewis and a couple of other things and a phone call about how you're doing and got to get around some people and stuff. And I said, got to get around some people. Yeah. You know what? There's probably good people at Bible study. You know, <laughs> at least they're trying to be better with their lives, right? So I, I go over to Lucy, and Bible study at our parish is on Thursday nights, and uh, I, and it happened to be a Thursday, and I, and I go over to Lucy and I say, Lucy, I'm going to go with you to Bible study tonight. And uh, she fell on the floor, and I helped her back up, <laughs> and, and then we went, and we were in the middle of, uh, we were about five weeks into. Um, uh, the book of James, the letter of James, and, which was perfect for me. Again, morality, yeah. very practical advice for living. It's, it was wonderful. It was something I could, you know, sink my teeth into. And uh, when, we, when we walked in, of course, I was the new guy there that week, so I introduced myself. You know, I'm, I'm the husband of Lucy. I get points for that, right? <laughs> and, um, and I said, but I, I, wanna, I, I just want to let you know I'm an agnostic. I, I, I'm reverent. I'm hopeful. I, I want to come to faith. I haven't been able to. I'm, you know, this is here. I'm, you know, 47 years old. I'm, I'm still trying. Um, I, I said, you know, I'm reverent. I'm, 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 I'm hopeful, but I'm, but I'm an agnostic. I, I won't ask any untoward questions. I, I won't do any of that kind of stuff. But I'm actually here on a philosophical and intellectual exercise, at, at least at this stage for me. And everybody welcomed me with, with open arms. You know, it was, it was, it was, it was wonderful. And um, the course was, uh, this was a course in the Great Adventure series, so it was oh, Jeff Caven's yes. teaching. And uh, you know Jeff, and you know his teaching style, right. and he's just phenomenal. And I just, this is great, you know? And, uh, you know, in short order, I borrowed the DVDs for the beginning so I could, you know, catch up on, the, on, the, on James. And then I found out that our parish had also the, uh, the full Bible timeline that Jeff does. Now, Lucy had already done the, the eight-week Bible timeline, but no, I found out they had the 24-week Bible timeline. I wanted the 24-week Bible timeline <laughs> because I, I really love Jeff's teaching, teaching style and the idea of going through the Bible all the way from, from Genesis all the way through Acts. You know, he just sort of stopped short of Revelation because that's a, that's a whole different book. <laughs> that's a different course. But to, 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 to be able to go through that and understand it, I, I really wanted to do. And uh, I just enjoyed the course so much and his teaching style so much. Um, and, and he brings up very clear things that you might not have otherwise realized. For instance, um, in order to properly appreciate the parables and a lot of the things in the New Testament, you really need to think like a first century Jew. You need to be able to immerse yourself in that culture, not just the fact that the Romans were occupying, which everybody knows, but you know, what are the other political players around the area? What's, what's the climate like? What's agriculture like? You know, for some of the parables you know, dealing with fruits and vines and everything else, you sort of need to know what the seasons are to be able to extract all the information that you can from what Jesus taught. So this idea of understanding or understanding it the way the original audience understood it. And because uh, a lot of people say, well, why don't they just translate this into 21st century language so we can understand it? It's because it wasn't written for that. We have to do the work to get into their mindset. It's not the other way around. So, and, and being a first century Jew also meant having a really good working knowledge of scripture which scripture for them meant the Old Testament, the Hebrew Bible. I was going to say that's another important point about that people don't often 
think about when they listen to the words of Jesus as he's speaking to an audience. He's not speaking to a bunch of pagans. He's not speaking to a bunch of unbelievers. He's speaking to Jews that yeah. are part of the Jewish church. Now they're struggling with how to live that life out with the laws and and uh, in the relationship with God. And, and Christ is here to help them draw closer to, to God through him. But they aren't a bunch of unbelieving pagans. Exactly. Exactly. And and. Everyone knows the scriptures. Everyone knows the, the important events and the important characters. So if you wanted to say that somebody was ruthless, you'd quote this person or, or you know, you'd refer to this person. If you wanted to say something else, you'd, and all you'd have to do is make one little reference and it would change the tone of the whole rest of the conversation. And if, if I didn't understand that, Jeff taught, if I didn't understand that, I w wouldn't f have a full understanding of, of what was in the Bible. I remember when we got the, the the Bible timeline and barred it. Um, the first inclination from both Lucy and I were, oh, do we really want to go through the Old Testament? Uh, you know, it's, you know, God was really mean and angry in the Old Testament. <laughs> you know, he's cranky. In the New Testament, he's nice. Why don't we just focus on that? And, and, and I'm glad I didn't do that because once Jeff taught that so much of the New Testament is a fulfillment of the Old and, 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 vice, and whatever the vice versa is to that, um, they're so closely linked. Um, that you really need to know the Old Testament pretty well in order to be able to, to gain anything out of the New Testament. So we went through that, and um, but one of the things that I realized uh, relatively early on was that the day I started having a relationship with God was the day I started Bible study. Hmm. Because here I am, I'm reading his word, I'm communicating. And that's what a relationship is about, right? Um, so here I am, an agnostic. I'm still trying to figure out how to have belief in God. And here I am, I'm already starting a relationship with God. It's a little backwards, but I told you at the beginning, I'm a little backwards. So I, I'm developing this relationship and getting comfortable with, with who the person is. I'm still having a hard time believing that he exists um, or he is who he, who he says he is. So we're going back and forth with that. But also what, what seemed to change uh, in, the, in those early times was the up and down roller coaster I had had and searching through questions and, and trying to deal with those metaphysical questions and understanding things. I used to work through that based upon what I knew God's characteristics were. Mm -hmm. But now I'm working through those things based upon who I know he is. And it changes the way you look at things because you know the character, you know the motivations, you know this and that. So all of that took place. Then a fun thing happened. James, James finishes up, I think it's an eight or a 10 week course. James finishes up and the lady that was uh, facilitating it, Alice, who had a ton of things on her plate, says, um, is there anyone who's willing to facilitate the next course? And my hand goes up, <laughs> I'll do it. And nobody else's hand goes up, you know? <laughs> and and uh, so it, it didn't occur to me the absolute absurdity that an agnostic is now going to facilitate Bible study. It didn't occur to me at all, but it worked out very well. And, and I don't know if no other hands went up simply because they looked at me and they say, oh, the agnostic just put his hand up. This is going to be fun. No, don't, 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 anybody else, don't let anybody else ask. So I started, I started facilitating Bible study. It might have been the very next week. We might have had a couple of week break. I don't know. But, but there were two things I learned real quick in, in facilitating Bible study. Number one was uh, the group is phenomenal. I mean, I just love standing in front of the group and you just see those eyes sparkle and you see the big smiles and you can just feel that love just oozing towards you. I love my Bible study buddies. Just love them to death. They're, they're, a, they're a huge part of why I came to faith and just that love that radiates forward. And especially when we're going through different topics and all of a sudden something clicks and you can just see it, you know, six eyes all of a sudden go, ah, you know, and it's just, it's beautiful. Uh, that, was, that, was, that was the first thing I learned real quick. And then the second thing was that um, as an agnostic, uh, unschooled person, um, I really do need to know the Catholic positions on, on matters of faith. And, and, and because there was a couple of conversations that uh, I wasn't able to facilitate very well because I really didn't know what the Catholic position was. So I started doing research. So not only was I doing the research for uh, whatever that week's um, uh, lesson was on and then the little extra stuff that you need to do as a facilitator, but now I was spending sometimes four or five, six days a week 
just spending hours a day studying the, 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 the Catholic positions on these various issues of faith. And I found it fascinating. And it was part of my, it was the beginning of my love affair with the Catholic Church. You know, I was recently um, helping my uh, youngest son prepare for uh, his learner's permit to drive. And you're going through all those, th the book, you know, and you're learning the rules of Ohio. You know, how do you do this? And some of the rules are just intuitively make sense. You know, when, when everybody gets the same uh, stoplight at the same time or stop sign, who goes first? Well, there's some intuitive things. But then there's some rules like, well, how far can you park from a curb? Is it six inches, eight inches, 12 inches? It ain't intuitive, you just gotta know it. Mm -hmm. It doesn't make sense. And that's what I think about when I think of an agnostic reading the rules of the church. Some of them probably made just sense to you, but others, they didn't just fall in line. Not initially, no, not initially. But the more I researched, uh, and, and I, was, I was looking for truth, you know, I, I would have, you know, I'm a respectful agnostic. I would have stayed a respectful, reverent agnostic, and I would have continued to facilitate the course. Uh, but I wouldn't have moved down the road for Catholicism if these things weren't making sense. So they were making sense. They were ridiculously uh, consistent and well thought out, and and it was everything was coherent, and all and all the scripture references supported the the the, the positions. And I got to the point where. I trusted the, the, the integrity of all the cross-referencing and all the, the, the checks so much that I started to realize that, yeah, if I didn't, if I didn't yeah. fall on intuitively, that I needed to research a little bit more. A definition of being agnostic is, I'm not saying there is no God, but I'm not saying there is. Right. Are you still at that point, at this point at in your this journey? Point, yeah, at this point in my journey, yes. You're hearing good stuff. C.S. Lewis's stuff makes a lot of sense. You got hit by a little bit of a two by four you know, and some of the aspects, <laughs> you're liking what you hear, but you just have it nidged farther to say there is a God. I'm just not saying there isn't. Right. You had said you had, at one point, this is where you began your relationship with God, but the thing is, as people hear your story, they wanna say, no, 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 no. God knew you all along because you didn't wanna hurt somebody else's faith. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. The fact that you had that within you is a sign of the seed that you were already connected, though you didn't know it. You know what I'm saying? He, mm -hmm. he was already working. Otherwise, you just said, I don't care. Oh, that whole first year of Bible study, I, you know, I kept reminding people, listen, I'm agnostic, I'm, I'm a newcomer, <laughs> all that kind of stuff. And they said, you're not agnostic. The Holy Spirit <laughs> shines through you like a, like a, like a sunbeam. You, you, know, you, you just don't know it yet. You just don't know it yet. I heard that over and over again. And it's, sure enough, it ended up becoming true. But uh, that sort of that, plays but, out. That plays out in a couple of months here. OK, well, then let's, <laughs> let's pause now. That's sure. like a good place. Our guest is Greg. Pratt will come back just in a moment. Welcome back to The Journey Home. I'm Marcus Grodi, your host, and our guest tonight is Greg Pratt, and uh, listed as former agnostic, though we're right in the middle of the story where he is still uh, an agnostic, though uh, it sounds like there's Holy Spirit is doing a number on him. But before I forget, his, he has a website, www.entirelycatholic.com, so you know where he's going. <laughs> okay, that's it. In, so let me, let's get back into the story. So there you are, the Bible study. I mean, you're, you're leading a Bible study, cracks me Yeah, up. and actually the entirelycatholic.com comes from really this part, when I was doing the research on uh, the Catholic positions on issues of faith because I wanted to be able to facilitate the Bible study properly. I just fell in love with the consistency of the message and the consistency of scripture backing it up, et cetera. I even went so far as sometimes, this is my science background, I actually went to the internet and f tried to find 
counter positions, you know, and uh, you know, you'd find every once in a while you'd find people who say, "Oh, the Catholics have it wrong," and this and that, and the uppercase exclamation marks and bold and underline, and and uh, you know, I'd read it and I'd go. Yeah, if that's what we believe, that would be wrong. You're right. <laughs> but, but that's not it. I found the vast majority of, of folks that had a complaint with what the Catholic position was just didn't know what the Catholic position was. Right. Um, right. The few that actually got it right, and, and uh, at least the few that I found, there might be a whole bunch of people out there that, that completely understand it. They're just not the ones typing at their computer with, yeah. with uh, underlines and exclamation marks. But the ones that the, the ones that got it right, first of all, their tone was much, which was much nicer. But the the, um, the the scripture references that they say counteract or or support their position, I'd read and I say, yeah, but they also support ours. Yeah. They, yes, they do support that position, but they support ours. And it started to make sense to me that if there's a full, complete understanding of the Bible, then everything supports it. And sometimes there's perhaps an incomplete understanding of the Bible, and some scripture references would counteract it. But one of the things that I struggled with early on in, in, in Bible study, C.S. Lewis comes to the rescue on this one again, um, was uh, I, didn't, I didn't believe in miracles. I didn't believe in the supernatural. I mean, you can't, it's hard to believe in God if you don't believe in the supernatural. And what I found, uh, well, uh, I went, I was going to the next book of his, so not Mere Christianity, now, now I was going to, let's see, what do I want to look at? Ah, his book, Miracles. That, that would probably be good for me, I'll, I'll read that. Again, love the author, and uh, it wasn't long for him to hit me by the two by four here. It was the first chapter, it was the first page of the first <laughs> chapter, and he explains to people like me that sometimes you have a mindset and you just have a blindness to what you're seeing. And he goes into it a little bit more than that, but what I took out of that was I was realizing that when I was doing my homework and I was reading through the Bible, I would, I would read attentively while Jesus was talking to the apostles and teaching them morality and, 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 and going through the parables and, and uh, the history with Rome, and I was reading attentively. And then when it got to something miraculous, always oh, healing the leper, I, you know, my eyes continued to, to, to do this, but my mind just sort of tuned out. It wasn't active. It wasn't conscious. It wasn't intentional. It wasn't because I was stupid. I don't think it wasn't. It wasn't. It wasn't because I was trying to hold onto my mindset. It was just something that happened automatically, and I was just literally missing parts of the Bible. So I I made an effort to stop doing that and actually pay attention. Now, starting just reading about the miraculous stuff didn't flip the switch for me, but at least I was able to process it. But the, the uh, again, the consistency was just amazing. And, and actually, I, I sort of predicted it, and, and, and the, my Bible studies can attest to this, because I, I was saying, it, it, it just makes sense logically to me. Ha having gone through the Bible timeline and knowing how rich this book is, 30 some odd you know, thousand verses, and all these cross-references, and these amazing links in a, in, a, in a work of literature that could not be put together solely by human hands. These, all, these, all this stuff, as a programmer, I'm going, just cross-referencing this is a superhuman task. <laughs> and if there's one entity on Earth that has the best chance at having a consistent view of Scripture, it's the Catholic Church. 2,000 years old, tens of thousands, perhaps hundreds of thousands of theologians, cross-referencing, making sure, saying, oh, Joe, you missed this, this count, oh, okay, got to, got, to, got to adjust the position. And over time, you end up with this consistent picture of Scripture that just, there's no holes. There's no holes. And that's, and that's in, in fact, when I started researching, that's exactly what I found. Hmm. And I was, I, I was sharing this as I was going through this with the Bible study, but I'm going, this is what I thought, this is what I'm finding, this is cool, this is great, you know? <laughs> and, and so we, we, kept, we kept going with that. But the, the um, and, and, and as you'll see here in a second, I actually come to the position that if I ever come to faith, I'm gonna be Catholic before I come to faith. Um, I, I was, I was, I had my Catholic card ready. If I ever could believe, this is this is this is where to be, um, simply because of the consistency and and these next and, and this next thing and and, and um, 
when, when Jeff taught that Bible timeline, he, he, he taught about the connections between uh, the New Testament and the Old Testament, and how, how, how certain things in the Old Testament can be prefigurements to, 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 the, to the, full, the fulfillment that occurs in the New Testament, and how those things are called types, and you know, this is the type, this is the anti-type, it's a little strange, but that's what, it, that's what it's called. This, this person, place, thing, event, whatever it is, always points to the fulfillment that takes place. And the fulfillment is always greater than the original type, right? And I love this, because this is connections, this is cross-referencing, this is, I, I just, I, and I love this stuff. And I remember, well, as, as I'm thinking, you know, am I gonna, am I gonna be, you know, if I ever come to faith, is Catholicism what I'm, is, is that what I'm gonna do? Am I gonna become Catholic? And I decided, if I do come to faith, I'm only gonna become Catholic if I can assent intellectually and, and emotionally assent to all of the teachings of the Catholic Church. This is what entirelycatholic.com comes from, is, is I wanted to be entirely Catholic. I didn't want to say I'm Catholic, but I don't believe in that part and that part and that part. I, pick and choose cafeteria Catholic. I didn't want to do that. Um, I just stay Christian if that was, if that was what, what it led to. So one of the things that I tackled was one of the more controversial issues in Catholicism, which is the Eucharist. And the question is, of course, is this a sacrament? Is this the body, blood, soul, and divinity of Christ? Or is this just a symbol? And at, you know, at, at, an, at an easy glance, you can, you can take either pick. You can, you can, if you put yourself in this mindset and read, okay, you can come to that. And if you put yourself in this mindset over here and read, you can come to symbol, okay? And even as an agnostic, you could say, well, okay, there was a human being that lived 2,000 years ago, and he did something with his guys, and so when we do it today, we're just remembering what he did back then. I mean, at the lowest, crassest level of merely, even not even being a symbol, an agnostic at least affirm the reality that this is like a, a photograph or a drawing of something Jesus did 2,000 years ago. Interesting that you should say that, because one of the very few things that I remember from my Judaism was every, uh, uh, on a, you know, every once in a while we get together for Passover Seder with my grandfather, and I remember the only thing pretty much that was drilled into our heads was that this doing the Passover and remembering it was making it present now. We are to be, to make it present now. So when he says, do this in remembrance of me, it's not just, hey, remember me, a photograph. It, it's not that. In the first century Jewish mindset, even, and even today, in the agnostic Jewish mindset, <laughs> it's do, is, do this in remembrance. The, the memory is making it present today. So, um, so no, I actually wouldn't have, I wouldn't have come to that conclusion. Um, and, and I am trying to put myself in the mindset of if Jesus is who he says he is and he said these things, could it be interpreted as a symbol? And I read it. And in fairness, I had to say, if I put myself in that mindset, I could read it and see that. And then this. But then I started diving deeper. And these types started coming in. And there's a whole bunch of different types for the, for the Eucharist. But the one that, that really resonated with me was you go back to the Old Testament and you go to Exodus and the manna that fell from heaven to sustain the Israelites in the, in, the, in the desert, right? God takes a million or so people out into the desert, cross, you know, goes through the Red Sea, it's escaped from Pharaoh, but now you have to somehow support a million people out in the desert for 40 years. How do you do that? Well, it takes God, you know, and he would be a cloud at days, you know, so that they wouldn't burn, and he'd be a pillar of fire at night so they could see, and all this stuff, always be before them, and do a lot of supernatural things for them to keep them alive. And one of these things was the manna that would show up on the ground every morning so they could eat. And as, <laughs> as Jeff taught, manna means, in, in Hebrew, what is that? It's manna. What's that? So, you know, manna is, what is, what is that? And, and, and the name stuck. Um, so so this, this manna that, that comes to sustain this enormous sea of humanity, this supernatural food that shows up every day, and, and they could gather it for the, for the day. If they gathered you know, uh, greedily, whatever wasn't used in the day would spoil. They were, they were only allowed to gather for that day. Give us our daily bread. So they were only allowed to gather for that day. On the Sabbath, when they couldn't work, they were allowed to gather for two days' worth the day before that, so they would have enough to sustain them. And it didn't go bad on that day. So God knew what, knew, knew what he was doing. But this, 
the manna was supernatural sustaining food. There's no question about it. This is a supernatural event. Okay, I'm making a point here. Supernatural event, right? And now I look at John 6. Gospel of John, verse 6, starts with the, the, the feeding of the 5,000. And then the disciples start asking Jesus some questions, and they bring up the manna. They bring up, you know, he gave us the manna to eat in the wilderness. And they even, they even quote scripture. They even quote back, back there. And then Jesus himself says, no, it wasn't Moses that gave you that, that food. It was my Father in heaven. And he goes on through the rest of, uh, of, of John 6, saying that, you know, that was, that was food that, that spoiled, that, 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 you know, that, that goes bad. Don't, don't work for that. Look for the food that gives you, you know, eternal life, that, has a, that has, has a lasting thing. Your, your forefathers ate that in the wilderness, yet they still died. This was supernatural sustaining food for natural life. I am the true bread of life. And he goes through this magnificent, uh, uh, beautiful exhortation that if you read it, if you, if you read it well, in, in my opinion, correctly, you know, um, and, and, and I'll try and make the point once more as I, as, I, as I get this together, he's making a beautiful point about the fact that he, he, he doesn't explain to everybody who's going to be sacrificed, his apostles, and you know, everybody's going to be let in on, at the right time, but that, that, that his flesh is, he, he, he goes and says, my, tr my flesh is true food, my blood is true drink. There's no more literal way to say it. And he's saying, amen, amen, I say to you, truly, truly, I say to you, which is, which is code word for, listen, what I'm about to say is literal, pay attention. And, you know, everybody starts to murmur and, you know, oh, my God, because this is a disgusting teaching, especially to a first century Jew. So, you know, they all start murmuring. Now he's got 5,000. He just fed 5,000 people. You want 5,000 people to leave? You know, they're all turning around and heading for the exits. And, and, and what, does he, you know, what does he say? Oh, wait, wait, wait. I meant that as a metaphor, guys. Come back. Come back. No. He amps it up. And he says, no. And this is where he says, my body is true food. My body is, my, my, my blood, my, my flesh is true food. My, my, my blood is true drink. And, and in all the various things that he says through John 6, um, which I don't have perfectly memorized, and it's, and it's not the concluding point that, that sold it for me. But I go through that and I say, he was being serious. And eventually he let them walk away. Even after he raised the ante and said it even more emphatically, they still walked away in John 6, verse 66. I always found that interesting that the people that couldn't accept the Eucharist walked away in John 6, 66. Um, that's just the numbers guy in my, in, my, in my head. And I look at that and I go, and then of course he goes to his, his, you know, his apostles and say, well, what are you gonna do? You're gonna abandon me too, and, and, and you know the rest of the story. But it was the typology that got me because Sometimes uh, different people, different human beings can, can make connections between the Old Testament and the New Testament that really aren't there. They just say, you know, oh, this person, uh, he is also left-handed, so this must be linked. No, that, that, you know, that's not a true type. Here, in this case, in John 6, Jesus Christ himself says, Moses gave you food in the, in the desert. My, excuse me, not Moses, my heavenly father did. But that was, you know, they ate of, in, in the wilderness, and yet they still died. And I am the true food. He's, he's very specifically making the link that this was the prefigurement, and I am the fulfillment. Right? That's what he's doing. I am the fulfillment. The Eucharist is the fulfillment. And I go back to typology, and this is true of every type in the Bible. The New Testament fulfillment is greater than the Old Testament prefigurement. And you can't go from supernatural sustaining food to symbol. Because <laughs> a symbol is less than even a natural thing. I mean, I, I, me writing on a piece of paper is more impressive than a, just a symbol. You can't have Jesus Christ himself make the connection, say, I'm the fulfillment, and yet the New Testament fulfillment is less. It would be the only type in the entire Bible that does that. It doesn't make any sense. So he is the film fulfillment. He's greater. They had supernatural sustaining food for their natural lives. He is the supernatural sustaining food for our eternal lives. There's the step up, guys. There's the step up. It's real. So what he's saying in John 6 and in the institution narratives and, and this is real. And 
Because, you know, if you just read the words, if you just read the words, you can, you can stretch it and you can twist it to this interpretation or that interpretation. And I was being honest and I read them both ways. I said, which is it? Because I, was, I wasn't looking to confirm the Eucharist for myself. I was looking to find out what was true. And I kept doing this. And, and, and luckily I knew about the typology because then it was like, okay, well, we can't say this because it's got to be this. And so that was that plus some things with authority and, and, and uh, uh, just the, the, the structure of the church and the hierarchy and all, all this other stuff that, that just made sense. You see, you see fractures and divisions in other parts of Christianity and it's because they don't have a supernatural deciding vote to, to end quarrels. Yet, yet Christ set that up in, in, in Matthew 16, 18 with, with Peter saying, I give you the keys to the kingdom. Whatever you, whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Basically, you've got the deciding vote because there are only one set of rules in heaven. So there really only has to be one, there really only can be one voice on heaven that has that kind of authority. Um, th that was that was part of it too, and, and uh, so you were starting to see some of the real Catholic apologetics about the authority of the Church and Peter and the Eucharist and all of that, and apostolic succession and all those. Where was God in this? God wasn't quite there yet, <laughs> but at this point, between the Eucharist and apostolic succession and all the rest of this stuff, I came to a logical conclusion that if I ever get to if I ever come to faith, I'm going to be Catholic. So how did I come to faith? I started Bible study on May 19th, 2011. On May 19th, 2012, I step onto a flight that's going from Miami to London. It's one of the very few, very few times I travel without my wife. So I had a lot of time to kill on the plane. And I took along some reading material. I took along a DVD by Father Barron, uh, Father Robert Barron, excuse me, Bishop Robert Barron. Right. I'm still in the transition <laughs> stage. So Father Robert Bishop Barron is what we call him in Bible study. Um, I, and I took along a DVD of his, uh, The Seven Deadly Sins, Seven Lively Virtues. And I'm still, I'm still struggling. I'm still struggling. I'm still, 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 I'm still learning. I'm still bringing it in. And he goes through the introduction and he talks about Bob Dylan. He talks about being wrapped in blue and being sort of twisted in on yourself and just that, that great teaching style he has. And then he goes through the seven deadly sins, right? Pride, envy, anger, sloth, et cetera. And pride, yeah, I've had problems with pride my entire life. I was paying attention. Then we sort of just continued on down the road. And I'm sure that when Father Robert Bishop Barron was putting this talk together, he didn't know which sentence was going to hit me because it's a just a complete segue into something else it's it's a nothing it's a throwaway but between sin number five and sin number six he may, he just makes a simple observation that the last two sins are sins of weakness they're lust and gluttony now, i've dealt with lust my entire life i'm a guy and you know in the early days it was magazines and nowadays it's the internet and it's very embarrassing and i don't like that and all that kind of stuff luckily i've never done anything out in the real world but that's that's something that has tempted me and so when he says these are sins of weakness they're still deadly sins but they're sins of weakness they're a little bit more understandable and then he goes through and explains but i wasn't paying attention because my mind went sort of offline and i wasn't really thinking in words and i was just there and it was almost as if blocks were rearranging in my head and about a minute later I sort of came to and the first thought that I had was I believe in God and a minute ago I didn't Greg what just happened <laughs> and I thought about it then and I've thought about it since and the only thing that I can I, I can I can make sense of is I had all these different obstacles. I didn't believe in miracles. I didn't do this. It didn't, you know, naturalistic mindset, all of these different things. So what was the last obstacle that I had overcome? Will he accept me? I've got this very embarrassing sin. You know, would he accept, would he accept me? And apparently, Father Robert Bishop Barron's line of, these are sins of weakness. Still deadly sins, but a little bit more understandable. Just, it was as if, there had been claws in me all my life. And when he said that, they just sort of went like this, just enough for me to say, oh, I can come home. I can do that. 
So that's where God finally got me, 35,000 feet, somewhere between Miami and, and London. Uh, I don't know what time zone I, I, I was in, but it was, uh, it was a wonderful experience. I wanted to wake up everybody on the plane and, and say that something <laughs> wonderful had happened. Um, and I kept reading and I just stayed awake the whole time and, and landed and I got to the hotel, changed my shirt and, and instantly walked to mass. And which I wasn't doing as a Bible study facilitator. I was not going to mass um, because I was an agnostic. Um, and so I, I went to mass. And then because of the time change on my walk back to the hotel after mass, I call my wife and tell her everything. And she's like, ah, you know. And then then I find out she's telling she's t she's telling the uh, the Bible study buddies uh, and they're jumping up and down in the aisles <laughs> at mass that day and, and everything. So that that's that's how it all came together yeah. for me. Well, you really point out also the that believing well, what does it mean to believe? Is it merely an intellectual uh, assent? Is it a is it a passion? You know, is it a feeling? What 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 is this belief? Am I waiting for it to happen? I want to believe, but I can't. As the as the man said to Jesus, and there help my I believe, help my unbelief. Help my you know what is, it? and even in that, you recognize it's this mystery between the intellect and the grace that opens up our heart to all of a sudden real, realize the reality of God. Absolutely. I, 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 I realized that um, St. Augustine says, um, seek not to understand in order to believe, but believe in order to understand. Yeah. And it makes perfect sense. I was trying to understand all that time to believe. That didn't work. But then believe to understand. If, once I put myself into the mindset and read, then it made sense. Mm. And like I said before, when I was when I was still searching between Catholicism, not I, I'd put myself in different mindsets and do the readings. And sometimes the 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 issues of faith were consistent. And sometimes they weren't. But I was doing this backwards Augustine thing of trying to understand to believe, which is backwards. But luckily, when C.S. Lewis knocked it out from under me, and I had that strong faith, Jeremiah twenty nine thirteen comes in and says. You will, when God is speaking and says, you will seek me and find me when you search for me with all your heart. And when C.S. Lewis knocked it out from under me, then I was searching with all my heart. And it took me one year, from May 19, 2011 to May 19, 2012, and getting on that plane. And then since then, it's just been a blast. One of the neat things that happens in the journey of faith, as you're talking about, is when that happens, affirm this for me or not, I want to put mm -hmm. words in your mouth, sure. when you all of a sudden, aha, then you start looking back, does everything just kind of fall into place? You were describing the blocks coming together in your mind. Mm -hmm. Your mind was being defragged. Yes, exactly. <laughs> yes. It was being defragged, and all of a sudden, now there's order here. It's, were things starting to just fall into place then in terms of the faith? And Thing, things were, uh, over, that, over that magical first year of Bible study, uh, and, and this is why I, 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 I love Bible study so much. I mean, it's, it's central to me. Just, just it's because of the people, I love my Bible study buddies, and and I'm, and Bible study has done so much for me. I just want to give back and do that for you know for the next generation or for anybody. But um, what was the question you just asked? Well, I, this, I, 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 I really coming like, into order. But when, yeah, it, once you saw the absolutely. reality of God, th th things were, things were things were going into place logically. But then once that belief came in, then yeah, you go back over and you read the same thing, and there's even more in there, and it's still consistent, and it's still deep, and and it's just as as my dad would say, just you know, layers and layers and layers come you know come out of come out of the Bible, and it's just it's tremendous. I, I mean, I look at it this way: there was a point in time when I didn't believe in miracles, and I had this whole book at my disposal. This is the active, perfect Word of God. Yet I was skimming over parts of it; I was missing it. There were parts that were missing. But then, when I finally decided I'm going to take that that bias out and read all of it. Then I had access to the whole book. And if we believe that this is the inspired word of God, that this is, this, is, this is the be all and end all, and every single word in there is perfect, shouldn't we want to understand every single word the way it was meant? Shouldn't we want to know all the connections? Shouldn't we want to open our minds to see how it all plays together? Now, that may, that may take uh, taking a starting cue from the church's teachings. That doesn't mean you can't go check it for yourself. That just means you take a starting cue from tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of theologians that have done the work to say, here's a consistent position. Now go check it for yourself. You know? 
Don't, don't say, well, Catholics think they earn their way to heaven. No, that's not, that's not one of the Catholic positions, guys. It's, it's, you know, find out for yourself and see, see what it is because it's just so beautifully consistent. Well, besides thanking you for joining me on the journey home to tell your story, I want to thank you for letting our audience see a miracle. In other words, to see I, how I'm God glad His grace <laughs> to open you to give you the enthusiasm for our Lord Jesus Christ, enthusiasm for Scripture, for living your faith. That's a work of, of miracle that you wouldn't have believed in the past that it would happen. Right. But, but thank to His grace, not only can He do it to you, but He can do it to us too. So thank you, my friend. Oh, you are very welcome. Thank you for welcome. joining thank us here and sharing us the story. And thank you for joining us on this program. I do hope Greg's miracle of how the Lord opened his heart, le leading him all along, even though he didn't realize he was being led, even in his heart, his desire to be loving to other people. But that opened him up for the work that God was going to do in his own life. I pray that's been an encouragement to you. God bless you. See you again next week.